Sweeney Talks to. Today I'm joined by Rada Sterling. Now, her website is containedindubai.org. Now she, basically, if you get into trouble in Dubai or the Middle East, human rights, political, these type of issues, she is your first phone call. She's across the media. She's helped a lot of people. Probably the most famous case is Princess Latifah, uh, which is the ruler of Dubai's daughter who personally called her. And that was in the media not so long ago. But we'll get into all that. But today we wanted to talk to her because we understand why she does what she does, how she got into it, and what drives her. So thank you for joining us today, Rada. No, thanks a lot, Chris, and, and for having me on the show. Brilliant. Well, we've had a bit of recording uh, difficulty, so Rada has been very, very understanding. So she's still smiling, and I'm very happy. But I will ask you, um, how did you get into this? Because, you know, it's, it, it was quite a niche thing, but the UAE has become now a, a very sort of popular, prominent country. And you're now appearing in the media two, three times a week. But, um, you know, before it, it, it wasn't like that. But you know, how did you get started in this role? In uh, 2008, I was doing quite a bit of work with the production house Endemol, and one of my colleagues and friends there uh, telephoned me from Dubai. He, he was visiting there for a weekend and said that he'd been detained and uh, that what could we do to help? And of course, no one had any experience in dealing with injustice in the Middle East. So, I mean, I had to sort of swing into action. Uh, work with the local lawyers there and just imagine what can we do to get this man home. Uh, so we brought it to the attention of the international media. And of course, this was, again, the first case that the UK had really seen about a, a British national being detained in Dubai. It's not that it hadn't happened before, but it had never been spoken about in public. So the media went absolutely crazy. It was front page news. And of course, Endemol having produced Big Brother, the headlines were sort of big brother boss detained in Dubai, and it really did pick up a lot of traction. But um, combining that sort of lobbying and media and uh, pressure on the FCO and uh, British government, and then that same pressure on the UAE to investigate the injustice of this particular case, and with the local lawyers who we sort of leveraged with all of that, uh, he was released after only seven weeks, which would usually, uh, had he had there been no intervention at all, he would have faced uh, three to four years in prison. And this is without evidence against him. Um, so as a result of that, we um, uh, set up the website detainedindubai.org specifically for him with no real intention of doing anything further once uh, my friend was home. But because of that website, because of the media, um, subsequently I started getting emails from other people saying, well, you helped uh, Cat Lahoyard. Can you also look into our case? Can you uh, perhaps help here or help there? And this just escalated to the point where we were getting um, kind of 10 emails a week, which was, you know, very low at the time, but, uh, you know, compared to what we have now. But it, it was escalating. It was all sorts of cases, everything from, uh, you know, drugs, marijuana, all the way through to slander cases, or um, uh, we had a lot of business cases at the time, bounced checks and, and debt related cases and business disputes. And this sort of wholesale gave me a whole impression of the issues that people had come across in the UAE. And we could see that there was a pattern that people were being convicted in five minute hearings without evidence of a crime, or that if someone made an allegation, the police were taking that allegation at face value without even looking at the defense materials. And it was just conviction after conviction, theft of investment, the exploitation of foreign labor professionals, workers, and also there was a lot of corruption, which you know has changed over the time, and we, we still do come across corruption, but at that particular time, corruption amongst the police was absolutely rife, and there were bonuses for convictions, and the convictions were happening in five minutes, and we, we patterned out these issues and worked with a lot of different people, prosecutors, judges, lawyers, to sort of grow the, the intelligence that we had on um, on Dubai and the, the issues there. And from then it has just grown. And of course, you know, we're, we're 14 years on now and we've dealt with uh, approaching 20,000 cases. So we still see the same patterns though in the legal system and we're still addressing them. And uh, hopefully we've saved a, a lot of people from lengthy detention, from, you know, lifetimes in prison and beatings, torture, all of the issues that we've dealt with over the years has hopefully not only changed some of the UAE laws, but also protected people from these kind of human rights abuses. Well, I mean, it certainly has. I mean, I mean I, like I said at the start of this, I mean, if anyone goes on and they, they look at these cases, your name pops up or, you know, you're, you're commenting, you're helping. I mean, it's, 
it's no exaggeration to say if you, if you stick your name in Google, there's there's a numerous amount of people involved in legal issues that you're you're connected to. And um, but what I found very interesting there was you, you were at a TV a TV company uh, that made Big Brother uh, and, and and other types of things. So so in terms of learning, you know, the legal processes and all that, has that really just been a sort of a DIY effort on your part? Have you just built up a, a bank of knowledge and got to know people, and or you, have you have you went and done some sort of training? Uh, no, certainly a bank of knowledge and uh, from working with uh, particular prominent lawyers in the UAE who have you know, offered me quite a bit of their training from ex-judges and prosecutors who also have agreed with the kind of situation of injustice there and we're happy to highlight and share information not only about the system itself, the legal process, but also about the issues that they've seen in various cases and what the kind of changes that they suggest need to be made. And then listening to the stories and reading the case notes of so many hundreds of or well, thousands of, of people who have gone through the situation built up that that bank of knowledge. And had you ever been to, I mean, had you had any interest in Dubai, the UAE, you know, before this, had you been there on holiday? Was that a particular place in it or was it completely just the fact that your your old boss ended up getting detained there? It was completely incidental. And um, I mean, after we well, after going to the media and speaking about these injustices, human rights abuse and torture, there was no real possibility for me to go to the, to, to the UAE. And despite being asked numerous times by lawyers and, and various other people who invited me even to speak at events, it would be in complete violation of the local cybercrime laws there. And of course, well, a lot of Emiratis support the work that we do and encourage it. And in fact, welcome that because it influences change, there's others who consider any criticism of the UAE whatsoever to be a criminal act, an enemy of the state, and it's certainly against their local laws. So, of course, on, um, um, on, on that basis, I wouldn't go there. I think I would be asking for trouble and also putting them in an unfair and difficult position of having to either detain or deport me. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll establish you couldn't go there, but in terms of the, because, you know, they've got two sort of major airlines, Emirates and, and Etihad, who, who fly around the world. Would you be comfortable going on a flight of either of those airlines or do you think that would be asking for trouble as well? I mean, and I, I ask that because, you know, you know what we saw in, uh, you know, in Belarus recently when the, the plane was made to land, for example, w would you be comfortable on either Etihad or Emirates? Uh, no, I wouldn't fly any of the airlines who would be likely to stop over in the UAE or where there's a risk of stopping over in Dubai. Um, not only that, they've been on the other end of several litigations that we've had with complaints against those airlines in particular. So we have been in dispute and I would definitely avoid them. And, um, I mean, it's super interesting. I mean, is, is there a case maybe you, you would like to maybe speak about maybe that one that you feel is groundbreaking? Like I said, the Princess Latifah one's probably the most famous, but is there one that gave you the most joy or you or, or you felt sort of really changed things for you in, in particular over there? I mean, one of the cases that was very important to me in the beginning was that of Hervé Gilbert, and he's the one who actually helped Princess Latifah escape on the yacht recently. But in 2009, he shared his experience and he was dealing with the rulers, he was dealing with the uh, government of Dubai, and he was offering to build submarines and various other technology that the uh, police and enforcement agencies were going to use. And then he ended up on false allegations of embezzlement and fraud, which he had to then pursue through the US court. So I was able to see the sort of multi-jurisdictional issues that were involved in, in that case. And it was sort of the basis to go ahead and learn about all of these other amazing incidences where um, investors have literally been placed in jail, put on Interpol, falsely accused of crimes. We can look at, um, you know, that there have been so many documentaries made about it as well. And my investment in learning about the financial crimes, which were some of the most, well, the biggest injustices really at the time, because the media tends to be interested in, you know, cases where someone's accused of, of drinking alcohol or having sex on the beach. But actually it's these investors that end up doing the most prison time because they're looted essentially and the government of Dubai wants them in prison or other very important people in Dubai want them in prison so that they can take their money and they never want to let them out to speak about it but it's that kind of investment that also uh, brought me to Interpol and extradition and uh, stopping the um, the exploitation of extradition treaties with other countries so 
Uh, that brought me to Australia to fight against the uh, new extradition treaty between the UAE and Australia and ensure that human rights provisions were installed into that treaty. And that sort of took me in that direction where I was uh, representing people like Safi Qureshi, who um, he was a British uh, billionaire who purchased um, Great Britain on the Dubai World Islands for 45 million. And he ended up um, in prison there. He was facing years and years over these bounce checks and it made no sense. But again, we brought that to the media and six months later, he was actually released and exonerated of those uh, crimes against him. So we've been able to sort of save a lot of people in those uh, situations, but they're still ongoing. This is still one of the huge issues. And we have someone in there at the moment, we have Charles Ridley and uh, his business partner who, who was sentenced to 10 years in prison, essentially so that the bank and the uh, head of that bank could seize his property and money as well. So they've been kept as debt hostages. And after serving a 10 year prison sentence, the bank has the opportunity to now keep them in prison essentially forever. And the bank deliberately decided to add another 20 years to their sentence. And this is kind of unheard of in the West. And it's these sort of cases that are now getting the attention of um, Lord Clement Jones and Baroness Whitaker and various other MPs who are just wondering, how can we promote this mutual business relationship and we have the UAE UK Business Council and we have a lot of people promoting uh, British nationals to go and invest there and I think that you know all of that knowledge comes forward and it helps the UAE in a sense be forced to change and forced to instate those protections that British nationals need so that's become sort of a controversial issue as well and of course of course the Princess Latifa case um, you know, that, that's in the front of everyone's minds. I think it touched the hearts of, of many and it was, it changed the relationship that we had with the UAE. In the past, before Princess Latifa, we had so many different cases. Some we would raise to media, some we would not. And we would try to resolve those diplomatically with authorities in the UAE. On the other cases that we brought to the media, um, Dubai tended to respond in a favorable way. They wanted to preserve their reputation and ensure that tourists and investors felt safe to come to the city. So they would intervene if they saw a case of injustice and it was made apparent and clear to them. And perhaps it was damaging their reputation in um, tourist destinations and uh, well, you know, mutual, mutual partners that they wanted to keep, uh, particularly Britain. Um, and then when the Princess Latifa case came along, that was so personal, I think, to Sheikh Mohammed that he changed his tune. He has PR advice coming from all different directions and often it's terrible PR advice. And um, he, he changes firms all the time. They've all got different opinions, but I think with this particular case, it put him in the spotlight in a very personal and damaging way. And and throughout the world as well, not just the UK. And that has kind of led him to become, I think, more resilient in a sense. And he, I don't think he's ever been criticised so much in his entire life as in that particular case. I mean, we were talking about, you know, a woman who claimed that she was abused and tortured, and then she started raising issues of other people who had been persecuted or kidnapped or murdered. So his, so suddenly this almost glorified figure who comes to the UK and, you know, swans around with the Queen at the races and, uh, and he's seen in quite a positive light. He's this man that's created this amazing city and it keeps growing and, you know, it, it has become one of those destinations. In fact, I think this year it's one of the most visited destinations for British nationals or the most travelled to destinations. So he had created this amazing place that people were talking about only really in a positive sense. And if every now and then a case of a British British national being arrested for um, having sex outside marriage came along, he'd very quickly, I think, solve that case and try to move on and uh, get back to marketing. But in this case, it was so personal, he couldn't resolve it. it. He wasn't going to submit to international pressure. He wasn't really going to submit to United Nations pressure or pressure from Boris Johnson or whomever else had a voice in this particular case. And it was, and of course, that was very quickly followed by Princess Hire and the divorce, which again was incredible amount of negative media against him, painting him into this uh, villain 
uh, where she was frightened allegedly to uh, be in his company. She was frightened for her children. She spoke about Latifa. So from all different directions, he was being criticized. There were banners being flown over the uh, race courses in Kentucky and uh, protests outside the embassy all the time. So, but he had to stand strong on that in, in his position. He wasn't going to cede to that sort of pressure. And that sort of built him in a sense into a more resilient um, ruler to the point where he doesn't necessarily care anymore if he gets negative media, which is not necessarily a good thing and is ultimately damaging to the country. But because of this issue, attacking a yacht in international waters, it, it sort of, emboldened the criminal acts coming from the country that had previously been kept quiet. And uh, then he, he began investigating people who were involved in criticizing him. There were all of these disinformation campaigns that came out, you know, trying to discredit anyone who was talking about Latifa as though Latifa didn't even exist or the event never happened. This is initially before everything yeah. really... Yeah, well, I mean, really I'm just going to jump in there. I mean, I mean, if, if anyone's not aware, I'm sure mm. most people listening will be aware, but it was front page news across mm. the whole world where mm. Sheikh Mohammed's daughter, uh, Princess Latifa, essentially made a break for her own freedom. Uh, you know, she, she, she escaped Dubai with the help of a few friends and she got on a boat in the Indian Ocean. Mm. She was sailing off into, mm. to, to claim asylum when commandos came and dragged her off and took her back and you know there's whether she's in good health now or not that's again the Dubai government will tell you she's mm. in good health other people mm. may disagree but you know she was on that boat being taken off and she and it was usually phone brother wasn't it you actually spoke to her personally she was the, I think I think the door was getting smashed down as she was in a cabin and, and she phoned you yeah absolutely I mean she phoned me in in distress and uh she could hear gunshots they they turned out to be stun grenades but at the time she didn't know what was happening and of course she ended up back in Dubai but I think you know because of that act attacking a, a U.S. flagged yacht in international waters and getting away with it ultimately sort of emboldened them even more because then we started seeing them trying to spy on people you know using the Pegasus system to spy on uh, Lady Shackleton, Princess Haya and uh, and of course coming after us as well with these Israeli spy companies and trying to get information about our clients or our connections with Princess Haya and uh, ver various other you know they they tried to access my phone they tried to send me executable files and that kind of thing so that and of course, you report that to authorities, the FBI, you report it to the British authorities, what are they going to do about it? They didn't even really do anything about the attack on an, an international yacht. So that sort of behaviour has become really commonplace there. And a little bit of media criticism is not going to stop that kind of behaviour. So we're seeing that escalate. We've seen um, sanction violations. We've seen them illegally lobbying in the United States and pleading guilty to it as well. So this, this is really a kind of turning point on whether the United States and whether the United Kingdom actually want to allow them to continue to do this kind of behaviour. And of course, with uh, Russia and Ukraine and, and various other issues that have happened the past couple of years, I think it's kind of been deprioritised for the moment, but they certainly need to revisit it. Um, so those sort of cases have led to that kind of behaviour. And then, of course, we, we've got at the, the lesser scale, the you know people being arrested for what they've said on social media. And in some cases, even though they've made the comment on social media from outside of the jurisdiction of the UAE. So the UAE has extraterritorially applied their laws and then arrested uh, British nationals, American nationals. On what Did someone not get arrested for, was it, was it, they called someone a donkey, but they, they wrote the post, they wrote the post outside the UAE, but they called someone a donkey. And then when they, when they got to the UAE, they were, they were arrested for that. My, my good friend, Lala Sharavesh, actually, <laughs> now, um, she, uh, she had five years before ever traveling to Dubai, she had made a post on Facebook uh, saying to her ex-husband, um, congratulations, you married a horse or something to this effect. Yeah. And it was, a, you know, private, it was on a lockdown Facebook, but somehow um, the horse <laughs> found this post and uh, reported it to the Dubai police. So when he died, um, she traveled out there with her daughter to pay her respects at the funeral. And she was arrested on arrival for this post made five years before traveling. And uh, 
I, I think, you know, cybercrime violations are serious in the UAE and you can go to prison for a couple of years over it. And that's what she was being threatened with. And the complainant was pushing for the absolute maximum possible sentence, even though she was the sole custodian of her daughter, even though the, you know, the distress that that caused was incredible. But I mean, the media, again, really just felt so uh, terrible about that situation. Like, how can that happen to someone? And if it's happened to her, can I be arrested for something I've said on Twitter five years ago? And it is shocking, actually, when you look at it that way. And uh, that case, I mean, and there have been many, many other cases since then. There have been, you know, of a similar nature where people have been arrested for a private WhatsApp message sent possibly between a husband and wife or in another instance um, to a um, flatmate. And people have been arrested for this, detained, deported, even sentenced. So that particular law hasn't changed and it's only getting worse, in fact. So people can be arrested for saying something on social media about the weather conditions, or they could be sharing disinformation, which could include anything that the government deems, you know, wrong or about Dubai or anything at all. For example, it, it could be something as basic as criticizing Emirates Airline for some service. So it, it actually goes that low. We've had people arrested for um, giving a bad rating on a, uh, on a hotel. What? So, yeah, that's, absolutely. And we had a British. That's mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it's yeah. mind blowing. And, and and I think one thing I'd like to see. I mean, I'm, you know, I I have to full disclosure. I actually spent part of my uh, well, my family lived in the UAE, so you know, but you know, um, when I when I was younger as well. So I, I do have some experience of it. And one thing I don't think a lot of people understand in the West is that the complete power of people like Sheikh Mohammed, there is no legal recourse. There is they may have a court system, but. I mean, you'd be as well. I mean, it's, it's almost as, as good as a chocolate teapot. I mean, you're not going to take someone like Sheikh Mohammed or the Dubai government or the authorities. You're not going to find any legal recourse. Is that right? It's just going to be stonewalled, even though these, mm. these structures may exist. Mm. Absolutely. You're not allowed to. I mean, you, you can't. You can't succeed against the Dubai government or particularly the rulers. Anyone who has spoken about a, um, their ideals of a political situation that's different from how it is now has actually been jailed, tortured and uh, banned from leaving the country. So, I mean, you can just look at Ahmed Mansour, who has been in prison in and out all the time. And there's huge campaigns for him to support him, even in the United Kingdom. There, there's so many followers trying to get him released simply because he wanted a different political structure. And that is seen as a criticism of the government. And that is not acceptable under any circumstances. And again, when the Princess Latifa case was going on, expats were even frightened to mention it. So they would whisper and they wouldn't say anything. They were worried that, uh, that they would be arrested if they started talking about it or potentially supporting Latifa at that time. Mm. I mean, one thing that's quite interesting is that you and I are having this conversation right now and when this gets out there into the ether, none of this will be reported in Dubai. I mean, there's no way any media will, will run anything that you've said, which, which in another case, I mean, if we were talking about the UK or we're talking about Spain or Colombia, Mm. Some newspaper probably would, would pick up a few parts of what you're saying and, and, and just run them as a few quotes, but there's absolutely no way anyone in Dubai or the UAE will hear about this conversation, which, which kind of underlines what you're saying. Yes, although even in the prison, they play the BBC to the prisoners. And this, this was a huge issue to them because they didn't know, should we just ban the BBC? And I think they thought that would be a terrible PR move. So they let it go. They don't like it. But, um, yes, yes, it won't be reported on. However, around about sort of 2017, I think was when journalists started getting afraid of, of speaking or reporting on cases. Up until then, there were quite a few journalists at the National and uh, Seven Days, which I think was previously owned by Daily Mail. They would report on our cases. They would even quote me. They would even say, OK, this is an injustice. There's been a failing with the prosecutor or something like that. And then someone in authority in the UAE has said no more. And they've issued a directive to all of the newspapers. And they have really clamped down on free speech, even to the point where, uh, well, not free speech, but at least open reporting and dialogue. Um, even some reporters have been afraid, they've been 
uh, they've, they've left the country and the government of Dubai has actually tried to track them down and find out who wrote that article because we're going to go after them. And they are threatening and they are scary. And that's something Reporters Without Borders is actually looking into at the moment, just that, that concern for reporters out there. And I mean, obviously I'd appreciate your honesty on this one. I mean, you and I talking. So would I have a problem now? I mean, I've not been to you in a number of years, but if I, if I was to go back, do you think I would have an issue now, the fact that, you know, we, we've done this and I've also I've spoken to you previously for other, you know, for other uh, media things. Um, do, do you think I would have an issue now then? I mean, technically you would be considered to be in violation of the law, but the question comes down to whether someone would raise that to the attention of the authorities, because they probably wouldn't have you on a list of people who have offended them when you go in. But if it was raised to them and someone made a complaint, then they would uh, potentially put that through. But they would have to balance that against, would they want the publicity of arresting a British journalist for him simply interviewing something, someone about what's going on there? And I would say the answer to that is no, except at the lower levels of the police and prosecutors who don't consider the kind of overall situation there, the public relations situation, might just accidentally put you through and, and before you know it, it's suddenly in the BBC. So I, I would say it's 50-50. Well, if I if I do go around that, I'll be keeping your uh, I'll be keeping your mobile phone number it's sort of written down a bit of paper in my in my socks exactly. or something like that, you know, just, just in case. <laughs> I mean, we're well, talking about the BBC there. And I mean, I don't know if you saw the, the recent documentary on, on Dubai, which was a three-part documentary that ran on the BBC. Um, and a lot of people sort of criticized mm. it. And I mean, maybe people out there might want to go watch it, or maybe people listening may have watched it. Mm. And it painted Dubai as a kind of Las Vegas, you know, uh, beaches, nice villas, mm. you know, uh, Nice cars. You, you can party mm -hmm. all day. You can you can do mm -hmm. certain things. Were you? Is there a is there still a, a resistance to encountering the other side of Dubai because it seemed that was a very one sided portrayal of the country or the or the city, should I say? I mean, it was certainly a, a one sided portrayal, and uh, we we had a lot of feedback from various reporters in the UK who uh, suggested that that production would have been absolutely monitored from the, by the government. And of course it would have been, if it wasn't going to be positive, it would never have been made very much like uh, Sex in the City or other movies who might've tried to portray them in a negative light or a show. Absolutely, they wouldn't be allowed to do so. And other reporters who have visited the UAE to record anything that a documentary about perhaps someone in a difficult situation, they have done so very much on the quiet. And those journalists who have produced those movies never traveled through Dubai again. Again, after that. So, um, yes, I mean, the portrayal of Dubai, I did watch the show, and uh, the portrayal is certainly different to reality in so far as, you know, the lifestyle of, of the foreign workers there, um, the, the lifestyle of people there, and, you know, sort of making out that Sheikh Mohammed is this all loving person and that, you know, he's never done anything wrong or that, you know, Dubai is wonderful. Of course, it looks fun and it's going to attract people. Absolutely, but it is going to lead to more human rights violations. I think a lot of people were offended by that show. I mean, we had uh, Billy Hood's parents, uh, Billy Hood's being detained over CBD oil and he's recently being beaten by guards there. When they saw this uh, production came out, they were extremely offended that while we're in the midst of serious human rights violations, and that's the Albert Douglas case and uh, Billy Hood, where they've actually been confirmed to have been tortured and beaten by prison guards. And we have all of these other issues there. To not touch on that really much at all has deeply offended the families and sort of encouraged politicians to um, take it forward to the next level because it's just completely unfair and there's a lot of documentarians now after watching that who have come forward and said we're going to make a counter documentary and we're going to show the other side of Dubai as well because it was too one-sided for most people's liking. Oh yeah I mean I watched it and thought uh, I mean I'm, I'm I, I've got a little bit of uh, knowledge because like I said I've lived there and I've been there many times obviously over the years but I just thought like this is very you know we're, we're, we're just focusing on people going to open air bars and driving ferraris and uh you know spending so much on handbags and mm. you know it, it was really um it was it, it, it was almost like a tourist promotion i thought it's almost like it's almost like they were selling this is a tourist destination it's almost like free advertising in a way yes the best kind of free advertising <laughs> i mean i almost want to go there after that <laughs> um yes I mean, it does attract a lot of wealth. And, you know, what, what they said in that show was, was true in a sense, you know, you can 
be there as a millionaire you can be there as, as a vip and just feel completely comfortable splashing around and you know showing it off which is you know an attractive thing but what they didn't cover is the millionaires and in some cases billionaires who have gone there and ended up being detained because of their wealth because having that much wealth attracts tar you, i mean you become a target you have a target on your back people are looking to swindle you they are looking to uh, extort money from you they're looking to make a false allegation to put you in jail so that they can freeze your assets and that includes at the highest levels I mean we've seen uh, an investor start a company with a local Emirati that was worth 500 million pounds and the uh, local Emirati partner uh, accused him of embezzlement which was a false allegation so that she could get complete access to the uh, accounts and then she transferred it to a friend of hers who's a member of the royal family and transferred 500 million worth of ass assets for zero dollars and then th the assets essentially shifted into her he couldn't go to the country because of these charges against him so he couldn't fight it in court properly and he just lost out on all of his money and then Albert Douglas I mean he was driving around in a Rolls Royce also you know living the Dubai lifestyle he'd been there for almost 20 years and now he's in prison because of that and the charges keep coming the civil cases it's just like preying off these these millionaires and the people who are enjoying it now, as Albert Douglas and as these other people I've just spoken about, can end up losing their entire life savings, all of the assets, all of their investments in villas, and uh, and they can end up on Interpol or in prison, as, as they have, and just totally ruined. So living there might be fun now, but you certainly face a risk. And um, I mean, Alfie Best has recently warned a lot of investors and Alfie Best is uh, one of, um, I think he's in the top five uh, millionaires of this country. Um, and he's just warned a lot of investors. He had so many dealings with Dubai. Now he's told them, don't go there because look at what's happened to Albert. I mean, he, he can't stand the fact that, you know, that they're actually marketing directly to Alfie because of his wealth. And they're saying, Alfie, come and invest in Dubai. And he's saying, no, you've got my friend locked up there. Why would I invest in your country? I could end up like that as well. Yeah, I know. It's, it's absolutely shocking. I mean, just mm. adding back to yourself. So day to day, could you maybe take us through a, a typical day in, you know, in sort of Radha Sterling and in Dubai? I mean, are you on call 24 hours a day? Do you know what you're doing from time to time or is it essentially you just waiting for calls to come in? You know, what's a typical day for yourself and your work? Um, I mean, a typical day is we. Um, there, there's quite a good group of us. So other people will go through the initial inquiries that come in and filter them and divert them to the right person. Um, so we'll answer queries usually in the morning. We'll uh, produce press releases. We'll look at arranging podcasts. We'll uh, contact or arrange meetings with MPs or the FCDO, British government, um, trying to escalate quite a few cases or of, of course overseas as well. Um, prepare people for upcoming court hearings and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's quite typical, except when you get something like Princess Latifa. I mean, today, for example, I've had three calls from the prison. So that's people saying, you know, I should have had bail. But, you know, for some reason, I'm still in this prison a year later, even though I've got a court order saying that I should have been let go by now. I've served my sentence. So, you know, getting down to that sort of nitty gritty, resolving those kind of cases and uh, and advising people throughout the day. So are we on call? Um no, not unless it's emergency. I do get some sleep sometimes, but we, I mean, of course I have to work multiple time zones on a regular basis. So that often UK, United States, and of course the UAE. And uh, when, when it's an Australian client, that's a little harder, but we do it. <laughs> and in terms of, I mean, you know, the toll on yourself, because I mean, you know, you're, you're all dealing with a lot of people's, I mean, unfortunately it's their misery. And, you know, I mean, I, I think we can all say that, you know, you're, it's great work, but it, it's quite depressing work in some ways. I mean, you're, you're hearing people's worst stories, torture, imprisonment, you know, they're separated from their families, they've lost their liberty. I mean, mm. how much of a toll does that take on you personally? Because, um, you know, doing it day to day, I mean, you're doing it 14 years now, it must uh, eventually grind you down a little bit. I mean, you do have to have a positive attitude, and I think that comes from, I mean, it was much more distressing for me in the very beginning when, you know, you start hearing these stories that you haven't heard before. But for me now, whenever a story comes in, it's something that I've generally heard many times before. And I know how to deal with it. I know how to resolve it. And I know that I'm going to be successful in the end. So that keeps me quite focused and balanced, I suppose. 
when dealing with a, a situation uh, where someone's just been arrested and it's a crazy case, like like the horse case, is very distressing because you, you're having to comfort um, and deal with um, all of the elements. So that includes the, the lawyers, which can be very frustrating to deal with sometimes, the local lawyers in, in the UAE. And of course, the British government can be just equally as frustrating. But it's also every family that you deal with, they're completely new to it. So you have to walk them through everything. They're frightened, they're... So, I mean, of course that takes a lot of energy and it's ongoing because every day to them, why hasn't this happened? Why are we not there yet? What's, you know, and there's that fear. And I think, you know, working with the families and, and getting them through all of that is probably one of the most, well, time consuming elements of, of what I do, but also rewarding because you do develop those kind of friendships. And when you do finally succeed, I mean, it's such a relief. You can go and meet them at Heathrow Airport on the way back. So, I mean, yes, it's draining, um, but it's so fulfilling anyway, so I don't mind. And I, I know how to do it. I'm, I'm well versed. So, <laughs> and I mean, you know, I mean, something about from, from my own personal job as a as a journalist, reporter, features writer, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever uh, whatever phrase you want to attach to me. When, when I interview someone, a lot of times we meet about something, you know, human rights, or they've got an issue, and I, I write the story, I do the piece, and then I move on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they come back to me and go, "Oh, could, could we do this again, or could we could we highlight this more?" And I said, "Well." Unfortunately, I, I can only do it once or twice. I mean, I can't keep mm. doing it. Mm. I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, you have to maybe find someone else or, you know, I've kind of got to step back. Is there a point when someone's in a case where there's only so much you can do that you've got to say, well, you're on your own now or I've got to step back or I can't, I can't solve this? Is that quite difficult to convey to the person and to the family that, you know, your power is limited, unfortunately? I mean, I haven't had that situation so far, except, I mean, some cases, I mean, there's simply no avenue. So if someone suffered some sort of an abuse there and there's no legal avenue, um, yeah, I mean, it's sad. Yeah, you have to tell them, okay, you, you suffered this abuse and, and, you know, what can you do? You can go to the United Nations and they can make a ruling that you, you had your human rights violated. They can tell the UAE that they should compensate you and the UAE won't. At that point, yes, there's nothing much more you can do. So in that sense, I, I, I kind of advise them to get through it in a, a different way, perhaps. And some of them have ended up writing books about what happened to them and helping others and, and trying to, you know, do, do what they can to highlight that sort of injustice. And I think at least that brings some sort of closure for those types of people who don't have any more recourse. And, it's, and my final quick thing just to ask you about Sheikh Mohammed. So you've talked a fair bit about him, but in terms of personal dealings with him, have you ever managed to have any personal dealing with him? And I think he's seen as this kind of, like you see, he's painted as this kind of luminary figure who's created this gorgeous, mm. amazing city in the desert. And he's got the world's tallest building and he's done mm. all this sorts. Mm. But how would you describe him to people that, um, you know, maybe... Pr pr pre-Latifa, post-Latifa in general, how would you start describing to people? Because I think they probably know his name and know what it looks like, but they probably don't know too much about him. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a complicated kind of role he has, hasn't he? And I, I would say that a lot of his actions and behaviour and also of the other ruling parties there, you know, the Ras al Khaimah and Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, it's completely different. It's like... How would you describe it? It's, it's kind of like Texas and New York. And um, so you, you have him kind of wanting to take the uh, city, city of Dubai into a more modern and, in a sense, westernized place. And then he's also coming up against battles in, internally within the Emirates against other rulers who don't like each other. There's all of this sort of in, inter Emirate. Um, complication um, that they have to deal with. There's people who, and tribal influence there that doesn't really want the UAE to become that modern country. They want to keep it a little bit more traditional. Perhaps they don't even want to attract all of these tourists there and influence it in that way and have prostitutes at the bar and you know drugs coming in. Of course, they've just recently changed the drugs laws in Dubai. So there's a lot of opposition to that. And I think, you know, Sheikh Mohammed has been really focused on Britain and developing that relation. And he's done quite a good job on that. Um, I mean, the UK loves the UAE and especially now after Brexit, but then you have Abu Dhabi and they're not that close. You know, they have conflicts internally. Abu Dhabi focuses more um, on America and building up the relationship there. And 
of course, bailed Dubai out during the financial crisis as well. So there's all sorts of positives and negatives. But we should um, tell people, you know, why it's called, uh, I mean, I, I know, but I'm sure you can probably tell them the world's tallest building is not called, uh, it's called Burj Khalifa, not, not Burj Mohammed for, uh, for, for good reason. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, and you hear things, you know, I mean, of, of course, I spoke to Princess Latifa and um, I mean, she, she gave me her impersonation of him, but then I've spoken to other people who paint him in a more endearing light and don't agree with Latifa or even necessarily believe it. And they're, they're people, again, close to him. So what I would say is that, uh, you know, there, there is development and progress in the city. More needs to be done, certainly. And these acts of belligerence simply keep getting him into trouble. So rather than attacking a US yacht, rather than hacking into the phones of human rights activists and lawyers, I think he would be better off making those necessary changes to the infrastructure in Dubai that would make it a more productive city and a safer city for foreign nationals. Um, but then I think that people would generally think that he's one of the least unlawful rulers in the UAE because we have uh, Sheikh Saud al Qasimi, um, the ruler of Ras al Khaimah, and he's now responsible for a number of human rights violations and torture against British citizens and uh, other citizens. And it's kind of known as the Wild West of the Emirates. They've been violating Iran sanctions um, right in front of the United States. It was even raised to uh, Secretary Clinton at the time. Um, and uh, he was, in fact, indicted. He was charged in the United States with assaulting a uh, sexually assaulting a mate in a hotel and uh, I mean he it, it was quite fascinating to listen to I suppose what was behind his mind as well because we had this one hour uh, recording of an interview but with police and it was really interesting to see how he responded to um, th those kind of allegations and how confident these rulers feel to violate laws internationally and even when they're in another country themselves like we saw with Sheikh Shamsa being kidnapped from British soil you know so there is all of this behavior and that that still needs a lot of work so I mean there's there's going to be positive things about each character and also a string of negative things and also you know allegations of murder and we see in Abu Dhabi, not too long ago, that, um, I don't know whether you recall, but there was this uh, Afghani and he was uh, driven over. Uh, do you remember that? He was driven over with a four wheel drive and he, he was set on fire and also all sorts of crazy stuff. And he took action in the United States for this particular torture that was recorded unbeknownst to them. And they ended up settling out of court. So there is, you know, this crazy, like medieval kind of behavior that doesn't seem to be stopping and it keeps getting raised and raised and raised. So I don't think while all of these things are going on, while people are being tortured in prison, it's really hard to say that these rulers are good people because they could put a stop to it in one second. If Sheikh Mohammed says no more torture, no more human rights violations, no more unf unfair detentions, it would stop immediately because they do obey and they do respect him. Yeah, but he, he, he chooses not to do that. Yeah. And, and my final thing, rather, just to finish off with, come, come back to yourself. So anyone out there, maybe in any, in any role, in any job or about to start their career, university, whatever it may be, they're looking at you going, right, I love what Rada does. I want to be, I want to go out there and help people and, you know, do do good for human rights and, mm. and uh, you, know, you know, you know, try and help people in difficult situations. Mm. Any advice? on how to get started um you know do you take people on or, or, or other issues or other sort of training or do you think people should find their own thing and the second part of that question is the sacrifice to your life because i mean your your personal safety is something you, you've got to think about as well so i mean it, it does come with a it does come with a dark side doing what you do I mean, certainly. Um, I mean, we, we have a lot of volunteers, actually. We've had uh, interns over the time and, and uh, we have a lot of people coming, offering to help. And especially in the past few years, because there's just so many high profile cases. So, uh, yeah, we do, we do certainly um, train people up from time to time. On the other hand, I mean, it's good for people to really find their own passion, because for me, you know, I was very passionate about this and uh, and not just because it happened to be my friend who was detained in the first place, but just because I mean, it was fascinating, the kind of issues there. And I knew that I could offer something to that. I knew that I'd be able to help. I knew I'd be able to influence change potentially. So it was inspiring to me. And I think that everyone who wants to start something like this, absolutely, you know, get in the deep end, 
teach yourself as much as you can and then just start doing it because waiting until you you know have a degree in you know whatever it is or you know waiting five years until you feel confident to do something no just dive in start doing it immediately and you'll only grow from there so that would be my advice to anyone um, looking to either start an organization or help in a particular cause just look in don't even think about it just do it Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Radha. I mean, I, I, one thing I wanted to come out of this conversation is people to get an idea about yourself, because I think we read all these reports and we see Radha Sterling commented in the article, but I think a lot of people don't realise that, you know, what goes into that, the fact that you've done so much work, it, it's almost become a, oh, well, there's Radha making our comment and, and, and we skip by it, but we, we don't think, well, actually there's someone out there who's, you know, you are the leading exponent of this in, in highlighting injustices in Dubai. And Dubai's become an international city and an international, everyone goes there now, so what you do has been, you know, I don't think you're given the respect, you're a, you're a pioneer. So thank you very much um, for joining me today. I hope people have learned from it. And anywhere social media, can people follow you? Can people get in touch with you? You know, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yes, uh, our Facebook at Detained in Dubai, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, we're out there. <laughs> yeah. And if you go to Dubai, take Radha's, like I said, take my advice, take Radha's mobile phone number in your sock, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Chris. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much, Radha. Cheers.